Hallicrafters S53A, 1950-1959. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project available in video and in written form made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. This radio model has been manufactured by Halicrafters during the period 1950-1959 and it has been quite popular. What you see is one of many adverts of the model S53A, in particular appearing on QST magazine, December 1955. The unit under restoration must have been used a lot until various components started to fail. And it is possible that during its life, this radio did not receive significant maintenance as the components under the chassis seem to be all original. The external signs of burns on a few paper capacitors seem to be only the result of an accidental contact with a soldering iron by the factory. This is the original schematic diagram of the particular edition of the model S53A corresponding to the unit under restoration. The first edition of the same model was slightly different in the arrangement of the B-plus line. This schematic diagram for the radio under restoration has additional annotations to help in identifying the B-plus line, the automatic volume control line, and some important connections under the chassis. However, the plan of the components under the chassis is practically readable only from the written documentation that comes along with this video. After cleaning the chassis with alcohol, some rust spots are visible. They will be treated with a rust remover to avoid further development. At this point, the front panel is still attached to the chassis, and to remove it, first the knobs should be taken off. The original knobs of this receiver use a small Phillips-type screw, which also requires a small screwdriver with a particularly pointed head, like what you see in the picture. Considering that most of the shafts are perfectly round, with no shape, the knob screws have been tightened very hard to make sure that the knobs would not become loose, therefore some oil is used to soften them before trying to use the screwdriver. After the knobs, the lever switches should be released by removing their external rings. In fact, the switches and the potentiometers are attached and will remain attached to the chassis. The electrical restoration begins from the power supply area, involving also the final amplifier. It is interesting to observe that, after the 5 by 3 rectifier, the filter capacitor has a value of 50 microfarad. but all the data sheets of this type of tube report a much lower typical value. In fact, if the capacitance of the filter condenser is too high for the rectifier tube, it could happen that during the initial charge, the current drawn from the rectifier is too high, breaking the cathode bond inside the tube. It turns out that the power transformer is responsible for avoiding this circumstance because the high voltage secondary winding has a significantly high DC resistance which would not permit the flow of a too high current to the rectifier. 
If the power transformer had to be replaced, this particular aspect should be taken into account. At this point of the restoration, the radio returns to life even though the reception is still very weak. The restoration process continues with another section including the preamplifier, the BFO and the detector. In this area, the only thing that requires attention is the wire gimmick at pin 3 of the detector 2. It is then the turn of the third IF transformer, but that deserves a separate description. The typical mica capacitor is made by a sheet of mica coated with silver and possibly other metals to obtain the two plates. This composition must be protected from external agents contained in the air, otherwise it would deteriorate. In the 1950s, there has been a production of intermediate frequency transformers containing silver mica capacitors with no protection. Since then, almost all of them developed a deterioration that is known as silver mica disease. This issue also involves the IEF transformers used in important receivers like those made by Halicrafters. During a restoration, these intermediate frequency transformers must be inspected and usually, the capacitors must be replaced. The current slideshow represents the process for removing these capacitors, replacing them with new ones. In this case, NP0 surface mount capacitors have been used, but new mica capacitors could be used as well. The value of these capacitors is often omitted from the schematics, but it could be determined by measuring the inductance and knowing what should be the actual intermediate frequency that will be used for the alignment. For example, for the first two intermediate frequency transformers, the inductance when the ferrite core is completely inserted is about 420 microhenry, and the resonance frequency should be 455 kilohertz. The calculated capacitance is 291 picofarad, but a higher value should be put in place 330 picofarad in this case, so that the intermediate frequency transformers could be adjusted by extracting the ferrite core. The restoration process of one intermediate frequency transformer is repeated in this video where it should be observed how delicate the removal of the bottom rivet is. It should be clear that using a drill is not possible. The upper part of the rivet is slowly and delicately cut.
It is important to completely remove the rivet to be able then to properly extract the mica sheets. The loose terminal is glued. Once the old mica capacitors have been removed, the inductances could be measured. The max and min inductances should be measured, populating a table with data like this one, calculating also the extreme values of the capacitors that should replace the removed mica sheets. Unfortunately, at the time of the restoration, the min inductances have not been annotated.
next turn on. Here you see that a ceramic screwdriver has been used for rotating the ferrite core. This is not a good idea because the ferrite core is too tender and could easily break. A plastic screwdriver of the right size is necessary in this case. For example, like this one obtained from the stem of a very small paintbrush. One year later, a similar procedure has been followed for restoring the IEF transformers of a Hammerlund HQ100. The terminal flaps are bent straight, leaving enough space for the new capacitors. The loose terminals are glued with super glue to the bottom of the plastic structure. The flap excesses are cut. The new surface mount and P0 capacitors are soldered. The electrical restoration under the chassis is completed, leaving alone the radio frequency section, where the components seem to be still in good condition. In particular, generally, the ceramic tubular capacitors and the low-value mica capacitors should not be changed unless they have to, because of a verified failure. This radio receiver has been designed taking into account also the temperature drift, choosing the components so that this effect could be compensated. If these components were replaced, the overall temperature drift compensation design would not work anymore. Anyway, in the radio frequency section remain questionable components like ceramic disk capacitors and all the resistors that might be replaced in the future if the drifting compensation mechanism proves to be not working anymore. The power cord is not flexible anymore and it will be replaced later. Initially only a fuse is added. The variable capacitor has not been mentioned yet its grommets should be changed and this job could be done without removing it from its place and therefore without disoldering its connections. Here are all the replaced parts. Some screws have also been changed. They are all type UNC. Among the replaced components it is noticeable this 6BA6 vacuum tube that started shorting while testing the radio and this mica mold with the shape of a mica capacitor that uses paper instead and is electrically leaky. Having left this capacitor in place would have made the radio chassis and cabinet in contact with the mains. That C41 has been replaced with a safety capacitor. The variable capacitor has two shafts controlling two independent gangs of blades,
but in the same variable capacitor therefore this detail is not visible in the schematics. The main gang is used to control the tuning and is connected to the main dial indicator, appearing on top of the dial scale. The additional gang is used to control the fine tuning and is connected to the band spread dial indicator, appearing at the bottom of the dial scale. The original documentation is very detailed regarding the dial string and the restringing procedure. For the radio under restoration, the fine tuning dial string was still intact and effective, while for replacing the regular tuning dial cord, some 0.5 mm fishing wire has been used. The alignment procedure for this radio receiver is described in detail in the original documentation. Before proceeding with it, it is advisable to label the chassis near the trimmer capacitor adjustments with the letters used in the original documentation. To summarize for the intermediate frequency transformers, a modulated signal of 455 kHz is injected to the variable capacitor at the antenna tuning side, then the intermediate frequency transformers are tuned to get the maximum signal. The intermediate frequency transformers should be tuned from the top side and the bottom side as well, which is the reason why the chassis must be extracted from the cabinet to do the job. The original documentation recommends reading the signal at the loudspeaker output, but also the negative voltage from the automatic volume control line could be used as a reference seeking for the most negative result. Once the intermediate frequency transformers are properly tuned with the same modulated signal injected to the variable capacitor, the BFO could be activated. Then, the T13 coil could be adjusted to get a zero beat signal, no audio output, which implies that the BFO oscillator is generating exactly the same frequency of 455 kilohertz. Then the BFO oscillator is turned off, the signal generator is removed from the variable capacitor and attached to the antenna input for the purpose of aligning the dial scale for each band, adjusting the letter trimmer capacitors. After one year from the initial restoration, some better care about safety has been given to this radio. In particular, the chassis has been connected to the external ground and two fuses, instead of just one, have been inserted. To avoid ruining the chassis, the fuses have been put in a small plastic box that has been installed in place of the old electrolytic capacitor can already decommissioned. Moreover, the power cord has been fixed better to the chassis. For this purpose, three grommets have been used. The first one as large as the hole. Two smaller grommets on the wire, one inserted before and one after the hole. The cord end inside the chassis was secured with two cable ties. The external grommet has been pushed towards the cord end, remaining outside the hole. The three grommets have been glued with super glue to themselves, to the power cord, to the chassis. In the end, the cord could not be pulled, pushed, nor turned. The Halicrafters S53A is ready. The receiver is connected only to an indoor wire antenna. The test starts with band E between 48 and 54.5 MHz. It is recommended by the original documentation to tune the band E using the band spread control and leaving instead the main tuning indicator to the marked rightmost position on the dial scale.
band D between 14 and 31 megahertz. to establish a college of smart energy. Band C, between 6.3 and 16 megahertz. In the 40 meters band, 7 megahertz, it is possible to listen to some ham radio communication, although not very satisfactorily. Thank you. 
Mama. Band B, between 2.3 and 6.3 megahertz. Band A between 0.55 and 1.6 megahertz. If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment or old radios in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production.